you're listening to the Book Talk Today podcast, a podcast that inspires readers to obtain valuable insights to inform, educate, and improve lives. My name is Orn Abdi. I'm an avid reader, best known for the creation of the One Minute Book Review community, and I'm sitting down with authors to delve deeper into the books they have written to uncover the story behind the story. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 30 of the Book Talk Today podcast. Today we are joined by Alex Holmes. Alex is an award-winning podcaster and journalist. His work centers on positive masculinity and mental health awareness. He hosts the podcast Time to Talk, which is also the title of his book, which we'll be discussing today, which I have a copy. Alex, it's a pleasure to have you on. Hi, thank you, Owen, man. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, like we were discussing before we started recording, we have a mutual friend in Adam Lowenstein and it was nice to know that uh, we can connect. And I know, I think we've talked previously on Instagram, I think before, yeah. um, and we've had we've had discussions about this. So it's nice to actually be in person and have a conversation. Yeah. I think before we get onto the topics in the book and the, and the theme of the book, I think it would be good for some of the listeners to know your journey to writing and speaking on this subject in particular. Okay, so the journey to writing. Um, I'm speaking on this subject. So I started my career as a journalist. I was I trained as a as a journalist um, uh, back in 2016, um, and I kind of came out of the career in 2019. But throughout that time, I kind of had ups and downs in my mental health. Um, And my kind of experiences there really kind of coloured what would become um, this book and me kind of endeavouring to write it. So I always start a story by kind of telling people about the kind of the panic attack I had at work. And then I kind of had several more before I realised it was time for me to get into therapy. And um, kind of something to be able to manage the stress of, you know, living up to the expectations of other people putting over but you know being a people pleaser having less than uh, satisfactory relationships with people um and feeling that i was ultimately alone in a lot of the spaces that i was in um and throughout that kind of process um, there was a lot of conversations that were that i was having with myself around my friendships around my family around what it meant to be a man around success um, and around the whole mental health question because I know that, say, 10 years ago when I was in university, say, um, there was no conversations around mental health. I don't remember ever having that um, or hearing those words together. Um, I did hear the tricklings of depression and the, the sprinklings of anxieties in places and PTSD was reserved for veterans coming back from the war and... A grief was something that you know we all experienced we didn't but it didn't it, people wouldn't you know attribute poor mental health to it um as a as a subsidiary that comes from it and um uh, so yeah i began to you know slowly start to have these conversations i started a podcast um, it was called what matters back then it's changed to time to talk um since but i started mm-hmm. the podcast in 2018 where i wanted to speak to people around topics around wellness and well-being around say cancel culture what that looks like or how do you not get burnout when you're at work and just all these curious questions I was having because I was experiencing a lot of those things myself and then um I at one of the jobs I worked at I worked at on the metro.co.uk and I started a column called men talk health and that's when I started speaking to men about mental health about their physical health um and it was it began to interest me that there wasn't a space you know in popular journalism anyway that Mm. actually had uh conversations with men about their about them and their and their health you know there's always there's the men's health magazine which is very much about fitness and sometimes it dabbles in you know about sexual health and those little those things those things that you know traditionally you know men are told to focus on but um there was nothing there about you know what happens when what what the the story behind somebody who has penile cancer for example and whether that's even possible and how that's possible 
um, diabetes or um, you know kind of using breath work to help with with your motor neuron disease um, so it was really there that I started thinking about how I wanted to create a book around men and talking about um, you know how they feel about their body image how they feel about their vulnerabilities and love and belonging and mental health and self love and acceptance and all of that stuff that is in mm -hmm. the book and how so it's kind of it, it took a while for me to really kind of get to grips with what I wanted to say but once I found it I just it all kind of poured out into the book how has your relationship to your experiences changed in the process of writing the book my relationship to my experiences um I look at them now I mean <laughs> I have to know the book intimately especially when you've written these books mm. yeah, sometimes when you've when you've physically written them and then you send it off, you don't need to look at it again. Just probably skim through it and kind of find like the the, the typos or the things in it, whatever. And see if there's something you want to take out or add in. Etc, etc. But when you have to sit down and read the book for the audiobook, that's when you know the book intimately. You know <laughs> every single thing. And I look at it and I read it and I was just like to myself, this is actually so interesting. Who is this person? What are these experiences that he's going through? I'm really interested in him. Um, so the relationship I have with it is that of a that of a parent <laughs> looking at his this child and just thinking, ah, oh, now it's out in the world helping people. Let's just see how this grows and stuff. Um, and, you know, there are parts of my experiences in there that I still I'm navigating through, um, and it can be challenging sometimes. It's just super interesting that I'm in a in a space now where I can kind of look at look at it and just think hmm I'm glad you went through that because if mm -hmm. you didn't go through any of that you wouldn't have a book to write and you wouldn't and people wouldn't be able to connect with you in, in that way you know so yeah. it's one of, it's one of a patient observer that's a nice way to put it that's a nice way to put it it was interesting that you mentioned the fact that the discussion on mental health wasn't really the case when you were at university because i think we're similar ages so i graduated in 2014 and i started yeah. university in 2011 okay and i think part of the reason is the fact of the detrimental effects that social media has like i remember at university i mean instagram was a thing but it was not the beast that it is now yeah. and youtube was coming up but it wasn't really what it people know it to be now as this central communication platform and um, twitter was around twitter was around for quite a bit but i never really used it at, yeah. at university so it's interesting to think how and why the conversation has shift do you think it's in a direct proportion to the negative effects that social media has had and the publicity around that I would say it's a, I would say it's a huge part of it. Um, I started uni in twenty ten and finished in twenty fourteen. I did a four year degree, so. Um, okay. But I remember being. I remember actively signing up for Twitter. I remember that day of like, oh okay, I mean, let's see what Twitter is about. I remember my first tweet mm. was like, I have no idea what I'm doing here. <laughs> this is weird. <laughs> I remember it being something along those lines. I was in my dorm room or my uh, my hall of residence, and I was like, this is strange, but it's one of them things I do think that you know Cal Newport says a lot about this with regards to social social media um, and I, and a lot of what his kind of philosophy is is that it's moved away from it being about networking and kind of maintaining the networks and relationships that you have with one another to it being how it can kind of keep you on the on the on the device and the app for as long as it possibly can mm -hmm. um and i believe that and i think that that's something that has kind of really um triggered the way that we understand mental health um and the way that we kind of relate to our mental health because when you are consistently on twitter became addictive i was on it all the time once you tapped into a community you tapped into a um uh you know specific people that were kind of tweeting often and putting out ideas and you know whether they be funny or political or um toxic or whatever <laughs> you were in there and it became this thing where you're consistently thinking and what it did was it allowed you to just tweet your thoughts without them being 
filtered or edited or um, kind of processed in any way. It's as soon as you feel sad, tweet about it. As soon as you feel um, happy, tweet about it. As soon as you don't like something somebody said, tweet about it. But then all this stuff indirectly affects other people who are following. So they will take a lot of stuff out of context. Things will be kind of mm. said to them in ways that um, with no tonality or inflection because it's text. Um, people aren't really used to your voice. They don't know what you sound like. The people that know you offline will know how it sounds. Whereas people that yeah. don't know you offline will just see it as just a person here saying something that is kind of unfounded or, um, and whatnot and building on those conversations. So when it comes to mental health, it's like, the, it's a mixture of this need to consistently be present all the time and not have your thoughts kind of filtered and want to be, um, and, you know, like, want to be seen or... Um, you know, want to be popular or want to be all these different ideas that you have for yourself. Hmm. And it's, even like for things like Instagram, for example, as well, the images, the filtered images, the kind of things like that, all of that stuff, the need to consistently have something or to be liked or to do all that stuff, that kind of comes, that does come into it, I would say. It's the feeling, but I, feel like, I do feel like it's the feeling of not wanting to be alone. Um, you know, I was watching a 90s film the other day on Sunday and I was just like and the woman she was at the bar and she just had this drink and she was smoking at the bar obviously you can't do that now but she was at this bar she was just smoking at the bar and um, time had just passed by and she was just sitting there just smoking and thinking smoking and thinking and I was just thinking mm. if this was 2020 would she be right. on her phone? Would she be on, like, what What would she be doing? Would she be listening to music? Would she be listening to a podcast? Would she, would she be consistently distracted and pulled away from the way that she's thinking the way that she, and the way her thoughts were? So I was thinking, like, we don't spend enough time with who we are. We don't spend enough time with our thoughts. It's a bit challenging. Um, mm. and, 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 in that, and in that regard, then, we, are, we, are, we struggle to sit with the way we think and, and with ourselves. And that really mm. does impact the mental health question. And I think that that's something that we really need to, to challenge. I don't think people generally know how toxic that information that they're taking in is until they spend time away from it. I know sure. one, of the, one of the first times that I spent a long time away from it was during the month of Ramadan, I think like a couple of, a couple of years ago mm -hmm. after I came back from university. And I never really, I didn't think I used my phone that much. But I said for like a good, it wasn't the whole month, but for like a good two weeks, I wouldn't use social media a lot. And what you find is you come up with a lot of insecurities about yourself and you, you actually are able to hear your own voice in your head mm -hmm. rather than the ones that are being projected onto you. Um, and, and you're right in the sense that I think social media is a lot of postulation more than perhaps value. And as a content creator, it's difficult to perhaps not get swept up in that. And sure. I think I think it's it's a dangerous process to be in. And I think sometimes that you have to have the one side of it is like you're creating valuable content. But when does that valuable content trickle over into just you showing off? Yeah. And I think as as a content creator yourself as well, I'm sure that you have the same thoughts as well. You know, it's like we become this they're sort of like really doing stuff for the sake of other people and really outside of our own well-being and mm. our own stuff we kind of like oh what would would this get the most followers would this get the most likes would this get the most um attention would this will people see me doing this da, 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 da. Mm. and i just think that it just speaks to the worst possible parts of what it means to be human you know that need I know that people do need to be seen like I do think it's important that we are valued and recognised and you know and, and our work but then also I think that I also have to look at that and think to what extent though like how much do we need that in order for us to kind of really relate to one another mm. 
on a deeper level rather than making us feel like we are alone in in so much um, by ourselves and unhappy I just think that, that I think that that is kind of where we where we need to start looking we need to start looking at that sense of belonging and really trying to understand mm. that um, that that it starts with us being here for one another I don't want to get too friends um, you know the intro music I don't want to reunion. get too reunion know, yeah I don't want to get too friends reunion which I loved by the way <laughs> but I don't want to get too friends reunion on people but you know being being there for one another is actually something that is becoming more and more of a valuable commodity because less and less yeah. people are actually doing that and bringing that to the table so yeah do you think it's a bit of a wider issue because one of the things you talked about in the first part of the book was this individualistic mindset and i've had will store on the podcast he wrote a book called selfie and he talks about the difference between eastern and western philosophies of life mm -hmm. so my family is from the east but i've brought up in the uk i've lived here all my life so i see the dichotomy between both cultures from time to time with a home life here um, and then with friends and everything. And I think that the toxic thing about society in the West in particular is the individualistic aspect. And you can see this now. And if you look at perhaps economies like China, it's very much you are part of the system. Perhaps China is not a great example because they don't have great human rights. But the, the point being you're part of the system and you're just one of the people that help the country grow. Whereas here, it's like you have to be the person that is above everyone else because if you're not striving to be above everyone else, then you, that means you are, quote unquote, a failure. Yeah. So I feel like that's part of the reason, this is my thinking, about mm. the rise in mental health issues is because people believe that they have to be the one. I definitely agree with that. Like, the West is a very paternalistic um ideals philosoph philosophically economically cult just culturally in general is very paternalistic it's these are the rules follow them it's this is the hierarchy follow it it's this is what you you know competition is what makes us who we are communities um are no longer um something that we quote unquote need like that's and that's kind of what we've been taught in the UK and I think one recent example would be you know obviously COVID but in the UK we had a series of lockdowns and we were clapping for the NHS every Thursday night at whatever time I think it was eight yeah. o'clock and yeah. that was a brilliant opportunity because what I, what I found with that was when you step out of the your house and you look to your left and your right and you actually look at your neighbours like we know we have neighbors but not all of us know who our neighbors are and mm -hmm. i think that's something that's super important to me because i'm just like well what if i am <laughs> this is the most like extreme example but what if i am on the run from somebody and i'm being chased down the road and this is my street and i can't get into my house can i run to a neighbor's house and bang on their door or something and kind of and you know what i mean or like mm. can you know what i mean would that be something that would be able to so dramatic I'm yeah. sorry but the point is like there was an opportunity missed there that could have really had um the government really say get to know the people on your street like have street parties or street dip or whatever get to know your neighbors on your street and we did this kind of inadvertently with regards to like you know we were really trying to connect with our neighbors a lot more um over the time but then the government then went in and said no more parties of six in x y and z you know if you if you're na if you see your neighbor doing it tell the police and do all this yeah different stuff. I, I thought that was so and bad you're like and you're just like you've basically just created a, a culture of betrayal like and yes. of like stuff you have curtain twitches yeah. and all this different stuff and people be like oh who's going in there da, 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 da. and you kind of like people have to sneak through the back doors and all this stuff because yeah, so bad. you have really kind of like challenged the way that we think about community and what it means to be together and actually truly understand another i am hard pressed to find anybody who knows what their neighbors names are 
Mm. And it's always a revelation when somebody gets the, when the wrong package gets sent to your house and it's a next door neighbor and you've got to go and give them their their their, their package. They know who you are, you know who they are, but you actually see their name on the package and you're just like mm. you're actually a whole living person with a with a, with, with a life and, and an identity and a culture. Mm. But I don't know that because I don't know you <laughs> and look and you know communities are something that especially in the west I would say are something that is very um kind of spare spare and sparse you know so I would I, I like the the culture of the east in that sense in that you know there is it's a very much a community a, you know a um it takes a village to raise a child I come from the Caribbean that is pretty much where that's that's how mm. I kind of raised in that way you know in my community um you know it takes a village to kind of support one another and i'd yeah. say in the book at the beginning it's about you know we are we feel so lonely in an ever connected world but we feel we feel more and more lonely each day because mm. we don't necessarily have the support um around us that we that, that we so need I, I personally feel like, because I see it through our community in the sense of a religious community, being Muslim, I think that a lot of people see the negative sides of religion in the sense of the actual practical practice of religion, and they only see the negative downsides. But the, one, of the, one of the main reasons for religion is that community aspect. Think about it, the last month of, of fasting, you're essentially fasting with over a billion people. You're doing the same thing as a billion other people. If that's not community, then I, I, I personally don't know what else is. The mm-hmm. thinking that you're doing the same thing for 30 days as a billion other people, that gives you a lot of strength as an individual. And I feel like it's intellectually perhaps sound to think that you're questioning religion or the purpose of it. But I think from an actual spirituality point of view, I think it's somewhat of a, a lull over the past I don't know, 50 years perhaps, maybe the 70s was the start. So yeah, the last sev- the last 50 years. Uh, I personally think there's going to be a resurgence in it because I think people are feeling empty. Uh, I think that's why there's a rise in spirituality and mm. like you said, mental health. Um, but I think it's important to, for me, I think it's important to separate what mental health is, like general mental health, and then people with mental health like issues like proper mm. medical mental health issues mm. rather than just stress and anxiety you have people who have like medical conditions to mental health whether it's schizophrenia or whatever it might be mm-hmm. um have you found that to be the case as well for like perhaps a a lack in the bigger picture with regards to like religion or spirituality, religion, spirituality or your yeah. place in the universe yeah so um i do think everything is intertwined and I do think that we, and I agree what you're saying about, you know, we are having a, I've been saying for long before I wrote this book, um, that we, that we are kind of encountering a spiritual crisis. Um, mm. uh, people are trying to question what they believe in and really trying to understand what gives them meaning. And, you know, and this is why, we are kind of in a space that has, you know, with, with regards to like things like the Stoic philosophies, which are which are rising, which is, you know, the Thich Nhat Hans of the world. The, um, all of these conversations are are coming to the fore mm. because we are trying to understand that there's more to life than this, um, because the 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 roadmap that we've been given and the food that we've been fed is being slowly unveiled and unmasked as not good for us and a lie. And it's basically that Mm. in that, you know, everyone, you know, mental health, for example, has had huge spiritual connotations attached to it. You know, if you had schizophrenia, you were told that you were demented and you had the devil speaking mm-hmm. to you. When you're depressed, it's like you had the, um, historically, it was like there was a, a demon kind of like, you know, bringing yeah, you down. It was more like melancholy. More the melancholy, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and that. So, you know, you know, do you like your bipolar, you know, like your, you know, the devil's possessed you and all this you're different possessed. stuff. Yeah. And it's just like, and it's just like, these these are hard these are people that are hard 
these are things that are hardwired into the in, into the way that we kind of see and stigmatize you know mental health uh, mental health itself because those stigmas from those kind of spiritual well religious I wouldn't say spiritual from those religious kind of um, dogmatic uh, mm. you know um, kind of ideas have kind of have carried down and they brought and they brought it to and it, even to this this current present day um, you know people are struggling with how with how, with how they kind of deal with their mental health stuff and I find it a lot especially in ethnic communities and in religious communities and even when the two intersect there's a deep mistrust misunderstanding of what these mental health kind of issues entail yeah um and it, and you know and i think it's clear to, it's important to note that you know it's we, we must look at mental health in the same way we look at physical health you can be physically ill and physically well and both have health at the end of those sentences mm. mentally ill health mental well health like you know what i mean like you just there we go you know there are people mm -hmm. that you know have you know varying moods doesn't necessarily mean you have a disorder or an illness it just means you have varying moods that kind of dictate the way that you are thinking and the way that you are kind of navigating the world but then there are actual biological um neurological like disorders that impact the way that you interact with the world and the way you see things borderline personality mm -hmm. disorder is a mood disorder you know bipolar disorder is another one um ocd these are the things that kind of challenge the way that people inter interact with the world and we should not be stigmatized for that but we, but again if we had more community understanding we could probably be more caring into what the, into what this looks like um for one another you know I think the the important thing to understand is that everyone suffers from it from, with varying degrees. Yeah, can't I, be think happy the, all the time. I think. Yeah, I think happiness is somewhat of a myth, anyway. Um, okay. You're a man after my I, own. I don't heart. know. Perhaps we want to get into that subject, but I I think in relation to, to mental heart. health. Love that. Sorry. You're a man after my own heart. I don't completely agree. Yeah, I mean, you've probably read *Man's Search for Meaning* and others and, and other types of books like that. In the, in the sense that it's a, it's a fleeting sense of satisfaction that doesn't really give you much. And we are taught and we are programmed in this society on every level. And I, I mean, when you take a step back and you think about everything that you do and each habit that you do each day, from consumption of food to consumption of information, it's all to satisfy that immediate desire um, and to, to achieve that happiness. And I think once that veil is being lifted i think you you sit back and you're like oh crap i feel like it's it's like the blue pill red pill mm -hmm. in the matrix mm -hmm. and i think that once you have awareness of it i feel like you want the issue is is you want to come out of it but at the same time you know that you can't because from a practical level you need to still exist in this world and mm. you need to be a part of it i think the difficulty is having that awareness and still and still being functional mm. functional within it yeah that's for sure one of the things i wanted to talk about and one of the one of the questions or one of the topics around masculinity is this idea of toxic masculinity and i've heard that phrase being thrown around a lot and i don't particularly know how to define that but you'd probably be best placed to define that. How would you define toxic masculinity and, and how does it, how does it show itself in society? Yeah. So I'll caveat this with the fact that I don't like the phrase toxic masculinity one bit. Okay, good. Um, but toxic masculinity in its very basic definition is the, the, the negative part of masculinity that are amplified as the, and upheld as the, um, as the qualifying parts of what being masculine is. So that being things such as aggression, um, anger, um, sexual domination, power, destruction, um, being reticent, um, 
so holding things back lying um stoicism but not in the way that you know that in the not in the philosophical way but in the cold you you are uh, you will not see any emotion from me way <laughs> mm. um and ultimately toxic masculinity in itself is toxic so therefore it harms both the men who exhibit those behaviors but also the people who interact with men um from different oppression levels so you know we if we envisage this ladder where white men are at the top straight white men are at the top sorry straight christian white men are at the top <laughs> and at the bottom are like you know black queer women um and just in between that, there's just a rung of different kind of like <laughs> people who are kind of oppressed yeah. by everybody. Like, kind of that. Um, and obviously that's just kind of a very basic way of like doing that. You know, there's nuances and there's intersections and there's all these different things. The elements of toxic masculinity are there to to keep the order of society um, in the way it is. It works hand in hand with with white supremacy as a way to maintain um, maintain the order of the, of society that we have and um, that's pretty much the way I understand it okay. um, and you know it's the it's, it's a really it's a strange one because I look at toxic masculinity and I think to myself well it's harming it's harming a lot it's harming a lot of men it's harming a lot of men this idea of masculinity that we have this I've always looked at masculinity as a spectrum that is very long so I've always said there are masculinities whereas what we're kind of experiencing is a very small kind of fragment of that long spectrum of what masculinity is uh, that we mm. have at the minute and within that small section is toxic masculinity because you know and, and that's kind of what we're consumed with we see it with um, Piers Morgan and Meghan Markle. We've seen it with Boris Johnson and his various exploits in life. We yeah. see it with um, Trump. We see it I think with he was he was toxic masculinity personified. He was toxic masculinity personified. He was white supremacy personified. He was capitalism <laughs> personified. He was all of the things. Do you the think all those parts. three are intertwined? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can't have. Um, I'm gonna. There's a sh an episode that's gonna come out actually on my podcast with um, Kehinde Andrews. Um, yeah, we had him on the podcast yeah, a couple of episodes ago. Yeah, and I'm imagining you spoke about New Age of Empire. Yeah, and yeah. And it was in reading his book that kind of reminded me because I, I was reading. I was also listening to a show called Seen on Radio, and they had this whole. They have a series. They have several series, and one of the series was on men, so patriarchy. And there's another one that was on. Um, racism so white supremacy and I think somebody said something along the lines of white supremacy works hand in hand with patriarchy which works hand in hand with capitalism and you cannot separate the three because they work, they work on a foundation of one another <laughs> Mm. And I was like, wow, <laughs> you can't, you know, the, the very nature, like, you know, white supremacy, you know, patriarchy makes white supremacy possible, which then makes capitalism justifiable to all of to, in, to them. So therefore you can yeah. have white men who go and conquer the world and inflict terror among people. You can have men who do that, but, you know, from the situation that we have right now is the white supremacist capitalist patriarchal understanding of 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 the west in itself um so yeah like i do think they they work within one another they work so intrinsically that it's it's even it's very insidious and we haven't i mean you know it's hard and once you recognize where all of them kind of like all of them kind of sit it, you just think to yourself this whole thing just needs to kind of be reset because it's just been going on for far too long now. It's causing a lot of people to lose lives. Mm. You said that you don't like the term. Is it the term that you don't like, or is it the actual 
the way that people use the term? Um, a bit of both. Is it the definition itself. Yeah, a bit of both. I think I think the definition is you know obviously it's valid. Like the the, the negative parts of anything. Um, you just you got you you want to give it a name, but I think when people use it, as in to to as a way to kind of I want to say get one up on a man who probably isn't aware that he's exhibiting toxic behaviours. He's only exhibiting the behaviours that he knows how to exhibit. Do you know what I mean? Um, I yeah, it's interesting you say that. Sorry to interrupt, but I think it's like it's a matter of perspective. Absolutely. Because if if I'm acting in a certain way based on my, like for instance, me personally, like I never really knew my father, so mm. I grew up in a single parent household by a mum. So when someone says the patriarchy to me, I'm like, all I know is a matriarchy, because I like in the family in the family home, like my grandmother for the for our whole family, I have thirteen younger cousins and we all live very close to one another. She runs the show. Mm -hmm. Like in our culture, mm -hmm. the mother is like, you don't, you don't mess with the mother. And absolutely. I think that, sorry. I said, absolutely. Yeah. And um, so I think it's, it's important to know that there is a perception. So I might act in a certain way. And I feel like, by the way, this is where someone who has only been raised by a mother has an advantage because I don't think you have a, idea about how a man should act if that makes sense i feel mm -hmm. like part of the reason why we've got such a patriarchal system sometimes is the fact that in the household men are supposed to act in a certain way and then they yeah. take that into wider society yeah. so i think this is why perhaps single parent households i mean that's a really positive way of looking yeah. at single parent households yeah. there'll be very many 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 negative things um yeah. but i think that perception is very important because i might come across someone who's quite patriarchal but he might think he's not in comparison to someone else he knows. So, so this is the thing. This is the thing. It's definitely about perspective. Like, um, I come from a very, really weird duality. Like my, my dad's side of the family is, um, you know, largely men. And it's a very paternal kind of understanding. My mom's side of the family is very largely women. And it's very maternal side of the family. That kind of understanding. So, yeah, I take what you're saying. You're absolutely right. When the woman and the mother is at the center and at the core of the family, the family stays together, which is why I kind of look at the royal family and I think to myself, that is why it's still so strong because the grandmother is still at the helm of what is going on. Had so, and you know, we need to be very, very clear about what that having, what that is, because the moment that she goes, we're going to see a lot of disentanglement from the empire quote unquote the commonwealth we should say put an asterisk next to that um and uh, we're gonna we're gonna parentheses see empire. yeah parentheses but we're gonna see that um but you're absolutely right about perspective and i think that when it comes to patriarchy and patriarchal things um i think that it's the connotations that come with these things why is there a positive connotation when we think of matriarchal versus a negative understanding of when it comes to patriarchal and I think that both have their merits I just don't and I think they and what and I think the biggest lie and the biggest scam that we've been kind of like pushed into an understanding of is that they are both separate and that they both mm -hmm. come back together and only one can dominate at any given time yeah. which is the toxic idea of what our culture has kind of portrayed around patriarchal ideas whereas I know that if I like to stand in, um, in, in duality with a partner who happens to be a woman or a man or whatever, who has the matriarchal or the patriarchal understanding of what that means. You can work, you work together to create a complete understanding of what it means to be human, you mm. know, like if everything that men understand themselves to be as men is negative is it, they understand it to be negative there's going to be a there's going to be an identity crisis that happens because they, they you know what i mean there's like in in a sense it's going to be like okay so i understand everything that well, what men do to be wrong i don't want to be that kind of man so i'm going to be this way but 
no one actually think sits down and teaches us no one actually sits down and teaches us how to be yeah how, how to be like wholehearted men who aren't shit to women like you know what i'm saying like <laughs> we have to learn that like the very yeah. like I, obviously i don't know your specific situation and i don't want to kind of like tread on toes or whatever but in a lot of people who kind of see their fathers kind of treat their mothers quite badly just emotionally whether that be abandoning yeah. them or abandoning their children um even if you live in a house with your father and you see the way that he treats your mother yeah. and all these different things you see all of that you're gonna create an idea either of what it means to be a man versus what you actually take on mm. in that and I just think I mean, that there's yeah and I think there's just so much that that, that needs to be kind of unpacked there <laughs> but like <laughs> there's, there's so many things you can do in a lifetime so there I'm is. like you know like in in subcontinental culture i think that is very much the case i think that like my personal circumstances was always obviously single parent mother but she was working so i was actually brought up by my grandma okay mostly and i think that the compassion of an individual is definitely from my understanding and my experience talking to people it's the relationship that you have with your grandparents is very very important in a trying to understand others because the compassion for individuals is very much related to the understanding that you have with your grandparents and and your parents as well but i think that this is why for instance i think part of the reason why we we're having this loneliness epidemic or mental health is people are moving away from their communities but their their communities in the sense of their family first because community is like community can be your family but it can also be the wider community it could be the, the, the whole of civilization if you know what i mean so it's like the, your close-knit community i feel like is is really important and i think if if i didn't have that i don't know how where i'd be <laughs> you know <laughs> and really I, culturally a lot of minority ethnic backgrounds, so whether that be, you know, like Eastern, Middle Eastern, yep. Southeast Asian, Asian, West Indian, West African, so you know what, um, we are very ancestral focused and very familial, familiarly focused. And yep. um, typically, right, there's this whole thing about grandparents you know kind of channeling that down and remembering grandparents stories told through time and being able to support one another through family things family friends aunties uncles who aren't related mm. by blood but they happen to be always there and you don't realize they're not your auntie and uncle that you grow all this different stuff yeah all, yeah. all of that all of that stuff and that, that and that's what kind of holds a lot of kind of um, you know, ethnic minorities together is that idea of the family and whatnot. But the, as you said earlier about the individualistic nature of the West, it's this idea that when we, when we when we kind of separate the communities, you have more power over them. Mm. You know, because you can kind of, you know, kind of take them away and isolate them and kind of feed them ideas about themselves that they don't necessarily have which again which then leads back to the mental health stuff but it doesn't necessarily but it's not always not all that gets not all that glitters is gold sometimes you know because mm -hmm. sometimes you are in those communities and you are in those families and you can feel the loneliest that you've ever felt because you've because you're either you know of a different kind of sexuality or you may not necessarily agree with the religious ideas or you might not be you might not like meat and it's a meat eating family you might not you know what i mean like there's so many different things that happen you can feel so yeah. super alone because you kind of work contrary to the ideas of what happens in this community but this is the uh, this is the kind of the origins of anxiety and shame because when you start to step out of a community that c can protect you yeah. they protect you as long as you adhere to the rules of the community you st and if you do not adhere to the rules of the community, i.e., you marry outside of that, i.e., you, you know, 
you know, as I said, your orientation is different, i.e. your politics are different, i.e. all of that stuff. Yeah. Step out of that. It's the fear of being rejected by that and then you're by yourself. And then so now you're in shame by yourself. Mm -hmm. And this is what a lot, and this is kind of, to, if we're going to bring this back to masculinity, when you are in a community and an understanding that masculinity is this way, once you kind of step out of that that specific very rigid box of what masculinity is that brings shame to you once you're ejected from that community but when you're inside it it makes you anxious because you do not want to be ejected nobody wants to be ejected from a community so it's that kind of understanding when we look at um when you know when in the book when i look at what it means to be a man and what it means to have these kind of ideas of what the patriarchy is and masculinity and toxic masculinity and all of these terms that kind of like get thrown around and banded around when I feel like we need to redefine and restructure what these look like and what these are because as you said we do need community to feel as if we belong in a space we need families we need friendships we need real tangible connections as much as we need it with other people we do need it with ourselves first mm -hmm. but we do need the room in order for that to happen because if all of our identities are, are are stuck in the community what happens when we leave that inevitably in any particular way what happens when we leave those communities for any given amount of time how do we then come to terms with who we are and what our understanding of things are so a lot of men are kind of in this idea of what it means to be a man and then but they can't express any of the any of the things that they don't feel they're kind of they, they feel they're falling short of mm -hmm. what if you aren't tall and what if you aren't strong enough what if you aren't virile <laughs> what if you aren't all of these things mm. you know so I think interesting for me to observe this is the fact that when I was growing up, it was very much to be the man is to be the leader or to be the one that is making everything happen. And mm. I think that, I think the point that you made in, in the sense that everything that that's, that glitters gold or something, something mm -hmm. along those lines. <laughs> I think that what I'm seeing is the fact that we're having in our community, in our religious community, a move away from the fact that religion plays a part, but there's still, you still have underlying issues that you still need to go see someone about. Mm. And I think they both play in tandem. And, and that is a wholesale change from when I was a kid. Like no one was ever talking about that when I was yeah. a kid. Everything when I was a kid that I can remember was very much like, you don't do this you're going to hell and it's like well that's yeah. not helpful yeah. and it's it, it's now like how can you live a life that is beneficial to yourself and the people around you but but also you know for what happens after you die and i think that relationship's very important but i think it's very interesting that the conversation is now moving towards therapy and seeking mm -hmm. professional help mm -hmm. and i know in the book you talk about ways that you can go and seek advice but perhaps advice is not the right term. I mean, I've never help. Let's help. 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 How would you? How would you define? How would you talk about your relationship with therapy and what it's done for you? I would define my relationship with therapy therapy as a blessing. Um, I for what it's done for me is it's helped me understand who I am in, in, at any given moment um, and specifically what triggers me how I can how my reactions are what can be controlled to situations I cannot control other people and what they do but my reactions to what they do can be and I just it 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 opened me up to the possibility that my thinking isn't always on my side. You know, my thoughts aren't always in my best interest. Sometimes you need to watch them because they can kind of take you down quite an alley 
that isn't always helpful you know <laughs> that isn't always helpful <laughs> yeah, to you I, mean. I feel like i feel like it's about i think seneca said an unexamined life is not a life worth living mm. and i think what therapy does is it helps you examine your life in a way and so much so that it's encouraged me to train as a therapist myself okay. because I think to myself, like, I want to be able to help people in the same way therapy has helped me. But also, it's on, a wider, on a wider level, there aren't many male therapists just in the, in the, in the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, because then I look at it and I think to myself, well, who's helping the men who are recently divorced and struggling? Who's helping the men who are going through addiction? Who's helping the men who are just leaving prison? Who's helping who's leaving the men who are recently widow worse? Like, who's 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 helping those men? Um, and you know, yes, you do have those. You know, we do have support groups and we do have those things. But um, I think sometimes, you know, the one-on-one -on -one kind of therapies can be of a tangible help. And a lot more men need to be able to speak about these things about and feel like they're not alone in this mm. um so that's kind of like my relationship with therapy um and i just think that there are there are so many conversations that men just aren't having because they just don't feel like they can um but men are you know we are quite um lackluster when it comes to our health regardless unless it's physical health so the gym yeah. but checkups quite like luster um you know getting into therapy quite like luster um probably sometimes buying books quite like luster <laughs> like i'm sure both of us aren't like that you know no not <laughs> yeah we're not like that <laughs> but you know but we have but we'd be hard pressed to not find any men that are that aren't like that very we could probably yeah, list no, off i a agree few. You know. I, I think an interesting point you made is, and one that I wanted to raise with you, is your thoughts aren't you. They're just your thoughts. They're just thoughts. And I think the issue sometimes comes, and I, everyone's experienced this. I, I know I have quite a lot. Mm -hmm. It's like a thought comes into your mind, and you think that it was you who came up with that thought. Mm -hmm. But no one knows where thoughts come from. No one knows where ideas come from. No, no one, no one knows. Like there's no scientific evidence about your thoughts. And I think separating, like you said, separating your thoughts from how you define yourself is really important because if you think that every and you said it you said it in the book like how many thoughts do you have a day like 60,000 yeah. whatever it is yeah something like that if if you believe that you're everything every one of those thoughts is defined about like how you define yourself you're like what am I 60,000 things or if 10,000 thoughts are the same am I 10,000 of those thoughts mm -hmm. so I, I feel like that is a a very important thing and it seems like that's what therapy does is it separates you from your thoughts mm -hmm. and your ideas about yourself and finds the origin or, or attempts to find the origin of those thoughts for sure for sure I, uh, yeah exactly what I said about the examination of you um, and it just helps you learn how to relate better you know like if you are consistently having arguments with your mum for example and there's just always these arguments that are going on. I guarantee you, there's just something that is just there's I, there's clearly a personality clash, yeah. But also, what is what is being held on to there? Like you know, if something that somebody says is consistently jarring you, like <laughs> you're just like, well, what is that? Is what, what is that that is showing up? You can't. It's not just oh, I just don't like this person. It's yeah. Why? I'm I'm always interested in the why and where does that come from. Yeah, you know. So I'm, I'm, you know, I, I don't like taking things at face value. There's some things you have to, but I don't like taking things at face value all the time. Um, I'm always intrigued as to what that means and where that comes from. And I think we're I not think always, that's... we're not always um, keen to find that answer. Yeah, no, I think that's the purpose of self reflection, and perhaps therapy is a form of self reflection, mm -hmm. um, in a way of how speaking or writing is actually thinking. Thinking isn't just sitting in a room and just mulling over thoughts. It's 
writing it's speaking is actually the clarification of thoughts mm. so that perhaps can be the yeah the remedy the remedy for thought is Which, in speaking to to someone else so that's why journaling is so important too um but yeah yeah journaling is i mean it's key in the sense of not just for everyone thinks that journaling is i get a lot of questions about like journaling and i think that there's a difference between journaling for productivity and journaling for thoughts and i think you, you have to separate those two people always think that journaling is like the 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 bullet journal or like the time blocking journal and i'm like no it's not, no, it's not. It's like just journaling just... is you've had this nagging thought for the last three days and it hasn't left your mind mm -hmm. and you need to write it down otherwise you're going to have a semi-breakdown yeah yeah but you're right i like that distinction between productivity and the thoughts the thoughts journal i mean i've got several journals and <laughs> yeah, they are no. and they are for particular they are for particular things some for ideas some for my thoughts obviously some for productivity and actually it's funny you say that i'm actually was just thinking about i'm getting um the time blocking journal because i need to manage my time a lot better mm. um is it the Cal Newport one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was listening to his podcast this morning and I just thought, okay. actually, I think a time blocking journal might be something that I could actually okay. benefit from because I try to write them down in my thought journal and it just gets lost in the thoughts. So yeah, you can't, you have, you to, separate you have to separate them. That's been them. my experience. You yeah. have to separate them, um, for sure. Definitely, definitely. Anyway, Alex, we've touched on many, many different topics mm -hmm. and I think it was great to have you on because... I don't nearly talk, talk enough about this subject. Mm -hmm. I think someone who's in my position um, with my background in the sense of uh, familial, in the sense of not having a, a father at home or growing up since I was very young, when I was like three or four, I mm -hmm. think I haven't really talked about it. And I think topics like this are very important for individuals, um, whether they are suffering from mental health or whether they are battling with whatever it is so i admire you for being so open with with everyone and writing and, and podcasting i think is very Thank important you, so appreciate continue you. to do your thing continue to do your thing um where's the where's the best place for people to find you um so i only have one social media account and that is instagram so Sensible. go go over Sensible. to by alex holmes um I'm, I'm on linkedin but you know linkedin is just i don't know i don't know i just LinkedIn i'm on instagram by Alex Holmes and um you can go there but also just if just head over to my website alexholmes.co and you will find all of the things that I'm doing so the podcast the newsletter Instagram the book yeah everything's there so all um, thing all things Alex all oh. things Alex um, perfect yeah. thanks for coming on Alex no worries thank you thank you on Thank you for listening to this podcast. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more content. Also, visit our website www.booktalktoday.com to subscribe and download the latest edition of our magazine. Join our mailing list to receive the first issue for free to get a taste for the value-packed content that we are offering. Book Talk Today, for readers, by readers.